Hi, this is Joyce Polino Crane. I'm the news director at Westford Cat. I'm here today with Gloria Trahan. She is our U.S. Congresswoman from the third uh, third congressional district. Congressional Massachusetts. district. Yes, and um, welcome aboard. Thank you. So nice to have you. It's nice to be back. So uh, you. You are, you've been in office since, what was it, January? January 3rd. 3rd. Yeah. And you've lived a whole new life ever <laughs> since, haven't you? Yes, uh, it's been a whirlwind, um, quite a baptism. It's, there's nothing quite like taking your oath of office in the middle of a government shutdown. Uh, but it's, uh, it actually, there's a lot of work happening behind the scenes. Um, I got my committee assignments, and so it's been a productive few weeks. What are those assignments? Yeah, so I was appointed to the Armed Services Committee uh, and Education and Labor. Uh, so the Armed Services Committee is important to Massachusetts. It's you know responsible for $16 billion in DOD funding and supports nearly 70,000 jobs in the state of Massachusetts. And, and the person who's actually represented the third district has had a seat on that committee for more than 25 years. So that was an important committee. Uh, from an economic perspective, from you know protecting our military service men and women, uh, and our national security, but we haven't had someone from Massachusetts on the Education and Labor Committee in quite some time. So, Is that right? Yeah, it was uh, it was a tough committee to get on, but uh, we worked really hard. Um, we're persistent, and uh, yeah, we're the. Um, where that, that has jurisdiction over workforce issues, labor issues, certainly, you know, paid leave, uh, pay, uh, paycheck fairness, uh, but then also education, which I talked about the entire time on the campaign, whether that was college affordability, the investment that we make in early childhood, and then vocational and technical trade programs. So I'm really excited to, to get to work on that committee. So who decides? How does it work? What are the, what are the inner yeah. workings of Congress? That's a great question. Uh, because you, you put your name in based on what you're interested in. Uh, and you write letters. There's a steering and policy committee um, that helps decide um, how seats will be distributed across you know, geography and expertise. And uh, you know, you, I worked really hard talking to the dean of our delegation, which is Congressman uh, Richie Neal, uh, because he has to make sure that New England uh, and Massachusetts has coverage across a number of committees. So you really go to work um, on a lobbying campaign uh, with, you know, leadership, uh, the caucus, the steering and policy committee, and then certainly your your regional delegation. So, wow, it was <laughs> it was a whole new campaign. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> And um, I want to, I just want to remind folks of that picture of you being sworn in with Nancy Pelosi and your whole family yes. around you. And uh, it was just such a touching Thank you. photo. And it gave, I don't know, it just provided sort of insight into your your private life and, yeah. you know, how wonderful it is. Oh, I was so fortunate uh, to have my whole family there, you know. Um, my three stepsons are, you know, spread out, right? Thomas came in from uh, San Francisco, and um, luckily the two other boys were home on break uh, because it was on January 3rd. Uh, my two daughters were there, eight and four, Grace and Caroline, and they were actually on the floor with me, which is something I'll never forget, is uh, them voting for Nancy Pelosi as speaker, but then also, you know, mocking me by having their arm up in the air and, and <laughs> repeating the words, <laughs> same words that I was, I was uh, repeating. And then my parents, um, you know, my husband Dave was there, uh, my mom, my mother-in-law was there, my parents were there. And so, uh, yeah, it was, um, it was a moment I'll never forget. And it was also a moment of unbelievable energy. Yeah. Uh, anybody who watched the house floor uh, that day uh, had to just feel some optimism because it was the most diverse class, uh, freshman class we've ever elected to the U.S. Congress. And, uh, and then there were six, over 60 children, um, you know, in the chamber. And so it really did feel like a, uh, you know, a new, uh, a new beginning. So it, it was, a, so it was a shift. I felt it just watching, um, you know, when the president gave his State of the Union address, oh, yes. and you all wore white. Yeah. That was so symbolic, and, and I, I think we all felt that shift. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was. Um, it was so smart of the senior woman members to organize us wearing suffragette white. Uh, you know, it was a hundred years ago um, that we got that right to vote on the same place that we were gathered to hear the State of the Union. Uh, and so it was, but it was also powerful to sit together uh, in solidarity. Many of us ran for the same reasons. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it was, um, I think it's, it was a moment for people to remind it that there aren't going to be policy initiatives that affect women that are going to go unchecked. Uh, that we are there um, to make sure we have a voice at the table when we're talking about health care and reproductive rights and paid leave and early childhood, affordable uh, daycare, uh, and, you know, issues that are really important to, you know, women thriving in this economy. So some of your issues I, uh, I know are family leave. Yeah. Um, opioid crisis. Yeah. And um, you even got an amendment through. <laughs> Yes, uh, I did. It was, um, so I'll work backwards, yeah. but, uh, you know, there was a, uh, you know, during the shutdown, I came home um, every chance I could when we weren't, you know, taking votes or trying to reopen the government to meet with affected employees. Um, and there's the IRS facility in, uh, in Andover where, you know, 4,000 employees were impacted by the shutdown, you know, missing paychecks. Um, uh, you know, many had to take matters into their own hands in terms of going to food banks or getting, you know, supplemental employment. And, uh, you know, we heard those stories. Um, and we tried to do what we could from our district office to mitigate some of the, the, the damages, make phone calls where we could to ask folks in the community to be patient, especially when, you know, folks were defaulting um, on loans or mortgages uh, or rent. Uh, but you, the, the best thing that I could do was after the shutdown, um, there was a legislation for um, the federal civilian pay raise. It's just a, it's a COLA increase. It's, it's small. It's a, you know. COLA meaning cost of living. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and there was language in the bill that could have been misinterpreted to not include those very IRS employees that, you know, had been shut out of their jobs. And so I made an amendment on the floor to, uh, it was a clarifying amendment, but one that made sure that uh, IRS employees would be included, uh, especially given what you know they had just gone through. And so, yes, it was nice to have an amendment in my name. It was a bipartisan amendment where Republicans voted on and, uh, its passage uh, with Democrats. And so, yes, I have legislation under my belt. Wow. <laughs> Uh, after only a little bit more than a month, <laughs> <laughs> we did hit the ground running, which was which was great. Yeah. But you know, it's. I think what it, there's a huge opportunity cost when the when the government is shut down, uh, when this president is only wanting to talk about one thing, uh, and there's a lot of hysteria around that one issue, uh, that frankly, you know, the evidence does not match up with the the hysteria. There is no crisis at our border, with the exception of, you know, the humani humanitarian crisis that we've actually created um, uh, and the opportunity cost of just talking about that one issue is that nothing else gets done yeah. uh, nothing else gets moved nothing else gets debated on the house floor and I that's not what I ran on that's not what any of the people who came to Washington and this 2018 election ran on. We ran on solving the opioid epidemic. We ran on lowering prescription drug costs and uh, and health care costs. I mean, we ran on cleaning up government and making sure that you know the people who are representing us in Washington live to the, you know high ethical standards. And uh, and I think those are the issues that it's frustrating when you know if the president is controlling the narrative around one issue that you know is an evidence base, that you know is a waste of time and a, frankly, this proposal was a, was a waste of money because, you know, it, it speaks to the base that he deems important, but certainly not to the rest of the country. Um, so yeah, we were working behind the scenes on, you know, getting, uh, introducing legislation on paycheck fairness so that women and men get paid the same amount uh, for, you know, the same job. Uh, paid leave, making sure that you don't have to make those trade-offs between caring for a loved one or, you know, having your job or putting food on the table. I mean, those are real issues that I heard about all the time. Um, that need, you know, advocates. Uh, we need, we need progress on. How does paid leave work? Uh, who pays? Yeah. If, if I leave, 
to take yeah. care of my elderly mother. Yeah. Who pays? So this is a it's a nominal uh, contribution that you know employee and employer make mm -hmm. out of their pay, and it comes out to you know cents mm -hmm. um, uh, on uh, on the dollar where you. Um, uh, yeah, it gets put into a reserve so that when you need it, um, you are able to take up to 12 weeks. Um, and and uh, it, it's, you know, that's, that's important as someone, I'm sure you as well, I mean, I delivered both of my uh, children while working. My first mm -hmm. one, I was working in, in tech. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's important that, you know, women have the opportunity and men uh, have the opportunity to take care of their newborn. Uh, but certainly more and more it's, you know, having to care for a spouse who, um, you know, God forbid gets, you know, sick or, you know, an, or an in-law or a parent. And, uh, and I think giving um, people the time uh, that they need to do that is culturally where we want um, to be as a, as a country. We're the only, you know, we're one of the few countries that doesn't uh, offer it and certainly the only developed country that does not. Yeah, it truly is. A, we truly are. We make our make it difficult for ourselves. Yeah. And why? You know, it's real life. Yeah. I mean, these are. Uh, th this is this is not um, a work life balance question. This is, I can't I can't care for the people who I love and care for the most because I don't have the flexibility in my employment to do it, and it's short sighted. I don't think it. I don't think it's helpful to our economy and certainly not to our quality of life. Absolutely. Wonderful that you're doing something about it. So I know you worked really hard at, for, during the shutdown, during the furlough. Yeah. And um, you made, I, you've talked a little bit about it, but um, you were saying a little earlier today that you, you um, helped one person at a time. It yeah. Was, it was yeah well, we did what we could do yeah uh, you know it's I think when when it was all said and done we took 12 votes in the uh, in the house on reopening the government uh, and <laughs> uh, while each one of those votes was you know our us affirmatively saying you know you cannot uh, shut down the government when we don't agree on a policy debate uh, those were important votes for us to take, and we did. Ke we kept giving the Senate the opportunity to bring that legislation to the floor, mm -hmm. um, so that they could, you know, do their job as well. But when that's not working, you have to figure out, get scrappy about what you can do. So, you know, we met with air traffic controllers, we met with the IRS employees, we met with. Um, the prison guards and the workers in at Devons. Uh, we worked with as many federal employees as we could, that you know who were affected by the shutdown to to say you know what can we do on a case by case basis. And some of that you know we had some wins, right? I mean some of it was you know we need the um, the unemployment assistance office to handle um, the high volume of calls or have a dedicated line for federal employees, and we were able to work with. Um, you know, state government and uh, the governor's office to to make sure that demand was met. Um, some of it was, you know, I'm I'm going to be past due on my rent payment, and uh, you know the it's a it's a landlord that you know we knew. Um, so you know we were able to make that call and say, you know, would it be okay if you just had a little, you know, some patience? This the shutdown is not going to go on forever, and you know. Um, it's no fault of, of this uh, tenant of yours. And so, yeah, I think at the end of the day, constituent services is one of the most important functions, if not the most important function of a congressional office. I'm reminded every day that people call our office when they have no one left to call. They've tried everything. Mm -hmm. uh, they've gone through the proper channels. They've sat on hold for 25 minutes with Social Security. I mean, they've They've gone, they've done everything that they they could do. And they call us typically with desperation in their voice. Uh, and, you know, putting together a team that is empathetic, uh, that's responsive, and that, you know, really sticks with you through solving a problem is, uh, is exactly what we're there to do. And so the shutdown was just another example of that. So when you say putting together a team, yeah. does it, are you referring to your... Yeah, my district uh, office. Yeah. Um, so we have, have a team down in Washington. Um, they're mostly 
folks led, that help us with legislation. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have a team up in uh, up in Lowell. In fact, we moved into uh, Congresswoman Nikki Songus's office uh, at 136 John Street, right in downtown Lowell, and it's great space. And um, I'd encourage people to come down and, and visit. Uh, but yeah, they're mostly uh, caseworkers, people who help with constituent services. That can be veterans casework, immigration casework. You know, a lot, there's a lot of uh, bottlenecks in that uh, system that we we can help uh, help with. Uh, but then it's you know a lot of it is not intuitive, right? You. Uh, you know, paperwork hasn't lined up at the Social Security office, and you know your health care benefits aren't being um, you know uh, honored. So we might help uh, you know make a, a few phone calls to just connect all those all those wires. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's it's an important function of the office. We also have folks in the district office that help with economic development, community development. There's a lot of projects that. Um, you know, cities like Lowell, Lawrence, and Fitchburg, but also towns are grappling with in, in the way of, you know, grants for, um, you know, fire departments, uh, public funding that can be used to leverage private investment infrastructure. I mean, we just went through the Merrimack Valley gas explosions, and we're working hand in hand with the small businesses to try to make them whole and make sure their claims are paid on time. How uh, involved did you get with that? That was just such a tragic Oh, uh, it event. was. It was, uh, it's unbelievable, and, and, a, and a disaster that you hope no community ever has to go through, uh, because it's, it's traumatizing um, to have, you know, homes explode without warning um, and not knowing if it's going to be yours. Uh, and then the aftermath um, of not being able to live in your home for months at a time, I mean, it's just, what Lawrence Andover and North Andover have endured, um, you know, I, I consider it my, my responsibility to wring out every last lesson from that disaster to ensure mm -hmm. it never it never happens again. You know, a story that I know you'll like, Joyce, is that we you have an uh, opportunity to bring a guest to the State of the Union um, uh, and invite them into the the House chamber. And there's one fella in particular who kind of caught our attention during the Merrimack Valley gas explosions. And um, Ivan Soto is a is a Lawrence police officer. He lost his home, um, uh, him yeah. and his wife Veronica. They literally lost their home. They lost everything. They've got two daughters, and he once he realized his you know his wife was safe and his daughters were you know safe, he went back on you know his shift because you know the I mean the, we needed our first responders not yeah. just from Lawrence but from every community in the Commonwealth to uh, to help that that night. And uh, yeah, he went back to work and he you know made sure his his community was safe, and so I got to bring him uh, with me to the State of the Union. And uh, it was actually just on TV last night that his home is being rebuilt, um, and you know they're uh, they're scheduled to move in, in in the spring. But it really does. That's a nice story. It tells you a story yeah. about how communities uh, come you know, together, come together, help others. Yeah. Yep. And uh, and it was incredible for me to meet the two of them because I can't imagine uh, in during what they have these last six months, but. Are, are people out of those mobile homes? That yes. They, so they're back in their homes now? Everyone is back in their, mm -hmm. in their homes. Uh, and, uh, but there's, you know, there's still uh, kinks, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are some folks that are getting bills that represent a rate hike that they don't understand. And, uh, you know, one could make the argument if there is a uh, normal <laughs> or business as usual rate hike, this is not the community that should get one. Um, uh, and so we've been working. You, you, know, would, you would think. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's common sense, I know. Uh, but we've been working, you know, together as a delegation. The two senators have been leaders in this uh making sure that not just families are made whole and that their claims are adjusted, but you know, you drive through Lawrence, I mean, that is a downtown that is built on family businesses, mm -hmm. small businesses, bodegas, um, you know, small restaurants. markets, yeah. restaurants. And, uh, and you know, typically, uh, you know, there's, those claims are hard to calculate because a financial loss to a small business, well, it just doesn't come up in lost inventory or, you know, your monthly revenue. I mean, it comes up with, you know, customers not coming back because everyone's hunkered down in the community and people aren't shopping or leaving their homes because 
uh, you know, it's it's been a tough go. And so I think we're trying to, you know, work with Columbia Gas to make sure that they make those small businesses um, whole. And that we also signal to uh, surrounding communities that, you know, Lawrence is open for business. Uh, go yes. support them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good, good plan. <laughs> I, I actually used to live in Andover. Uh, I lived there for eight, 13 years, and and uh, I would frequently go into Lawrence yeah. and got to know a lot of people there. So sure. I felt really, I, when that happened, when that uh, gas explosion episode happened, I just, um, it was unfathomable. It really yeah. was, because I lived in a house in Andover that um, fortunately didn't have gas coming in, but I yeah. felt like it could have been anyone absolutely there you know my sister and her family live uh in andover and you know she spent the night at my house that night oh. um and you know the panic that goes through a, a mom and dad when they know their kids are home right so yeah. my my nieces were off the school bus and in the house and all they're getting in, is information that homes are um you know catching on fire some are exploding I mean, you can't get home fast enough. Right. Uh, and so that is, you know, this investigation from the um, NTSB uh, is ongoing. Uh, but, you know, there's what, what emerges from investigations like that are lessons and best practices that we already know because these things have happened uh, in the country. Uh, and we want to make sure that they, we make them, you know, we, you know, we quickly adjust our laws so that, you know, in Massachusetts, there was an early finding that a, a certified engineer from the state of Massachusetts needs to stamp those change orders when work is done on a pipeline. Yeah. Um, that needs to be instituted not just in Massachusetts, but across the country. Uh, and so, you know, we'll be looking for those recommendations that need to uh, be in, you know, federal, um, you know, regulations. Well, we just have a few minutes left. Um, I want to. I want to know if there's something you really want the community to know. Yeah. So, you know, there's, um, I know right now, uh, um, you know, the headlines are sort of uh, talking about, you know, border security um, and the deal that was made um, to avert another um, government shutdown. But there is a lot of things right now that are happening in our committees. Uh, there's a lot of legislation that's being um, introduced uh, so that you know we can get to work and this is a this is a Congress right now that has a collective urgency around getting things done um, and moving on issues uh, that we heard loud and clear from you know the campaigns last year uh, I was proud to co-sponsor HR 8 which is universal back background checks uh, for gun sales. Um, that was something that it didn't matter which community I was in. Uh, I think everyone from a common sense standpoint believes that background checks should be universal so that we're keeping, um, you know, weapons out of the hands of people who are either going to do harm to themselves or to, or to others. Mm -hmm. And so what is unbelievable is that, you know, Lucy McBath from Georgia, new freshman, ran uh, because her husband, uh, her uh, son, excuse me, uh, was a victim of gun violence. I mean, she lost her son and it compelled her to run. And so, um, you know, that motivation um, to, you know, to pass that bill to the ju Judiciary Committee first, but bring it to the floor is, uh, is what's happening um, uh, in the background. And I think we'll see a lot of movement. H.R. 1, which is the first legislation that was introduced in, in this Congress, is around cleaning up our government, making sure that super PACs and these dark money organizations disclose who their funders are so we've got more transparency in our in our politics, making sure that presidents disclose their tax returns, um, or that you know we um, we have the highest ethical standards for the people who want to serve in government, and then certainly, and I think the big one is um, access to the voting booth. Um, so, automatic um, voter registration, ending the practice of purging our um, our voter rolls, and and making voter access um, something that we champion as a country, so that more people can vote and and participate in our in our electoral process. Those are the types of things that. Um, you know, we want to see debated on the floor uh, because I think that those are the things that um, will help restore confidence and trust in government. 
Yeah, spoken very eloquently. Thank you, Lori. Oh. That was, um, it gives us su such insight into the world that you've now entered, <laughs> and it's so fascinating. Yes. So I Thank you. would love to, like to say best of luck for the future. Yes. And um, you know the door is open here. Absolutely. I love coming on the show, and to the extent that I can give a Washington update, uh, I do think that government only matters in so far as it uh, impacts people's lives, and so I think shows like this are really important um, to translate. You know what's happening in Washington in terms of why it's important uh, to folks here in the district. So thank you for having me. Anytime. For Westford Cat News, this is Joyce Polino Crane. See you around town.